the greatest victory of quantum mechanics is fully describing the hydrogen atom. You might remember we had an earlier video about all the different models of the atom that came before hydrogen. Uh, with quantum mechanics, sorry, not came before hydrogen. <clears throat> The greatest victory of quantum mechanics is the full, correct description of the hydrogen atom. You might remember our earlier video about all the different models of the atom that paved the way for quantum mechanics. Well, this quantum model of the hydrogen atom is the crowning achievement. It's the thing that not only tells us that quantum mechanics is an accurate model uh, for describing small things like electrons and atoms, it's also the foundation of the periodic table. Uh, the way the model is set up is you have a proton uh, over at r equals zero and you have an electron that's being attracted to it by this attractive potential energy. Uh, you've seen it before in physics too. This is just one over four pi epsilon naught, the two charges E squared over R and there's a negative here so that it is attractive. The thing that makes this different than the problems we've worked with before is that this is now in three dimensions. The best way to work this problem in 3D is to use what's called spherical coordinates. In spherical coordinates, you give a single distance R, that's our distance from the proton to the electron, it's going to be R, and you give two angles. You give and uh, a polar angle theta, that's the angle measured coming down from the z-axis, and a planar angle phi, that's the angle measured around the uh, x around the z-axis in the xy plane. You can think of these simply as latitude and longitude, and you pretty much have an idea of how this thing is set up. Because it's in 3D, we have three independent variables, r, theta, and phi. That's what three dimension means, is you have three degrees of freedom of where the thing can go. Uh, and so what ends up happening is that your psi is now a function of r, theta, and phi, right? This is actually really difficult to work with because we have to bring in all the derivatives from three dimensions. We have to, uh, remember for the, for the Schrodinger equation, you had this minus h bar squared over 2m psi double prime. Well, now that's got to be a minus h bar squared over 2m, the Laplacian of psi. And if you've worked with Laplacian, you know how much trouble it is in, th in spherical coordinates. If you've never seen the Laplacian, you're in for a treat whenever you get there in your calculus sequence. Uh, the trick we're going to use here is something called separation of variables, where we're going to take this thing and separate it into a function of r and a function of theta and phi, right? So we're taking the distance dependence and separating it from the angular dependence. Um, Turns out this is a really great strategy. The, uh, the y here ends up getting labeled by two integers, l and m. We call this thing the spherical harmonics. We're going to take a look at those in a code to visualize them, but these are literally just uh, 3D versions of the sine and cosine function. In fact, they're built out of sines and cosines. They, the, all the spherical harmonics come down to sines and cosines. It's just that there, you'll have sines and cosines of theta and sines and cosines of phi. The R here, we can end up studying the exact same way that we studied uh, one-dimensional problems, because this is now uh, a one-dimensional function. It's just that the Schrodinger equation has to get modified a little bit to account for the fact that we're in two dimensions. Um, I will save the derivation of that for you for a full-fledged quantum mechanics course, but what you end up doing is constructing what's called an effective potential, right, which behaves a lot like the real potential energy, so it's got a term out here that goes like negative 1 over r, but then it has a new term, it's got what's called the centrifugal term, that goes like positive 1 over r squared. What this does, this takes into account the conservation of angular momentum, right? Because electrons don't just fall into the uh, nucleus, right? If that were the case, we wouldn't have any matter and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, but because of conservation of angular momentum, because it is spinning around the proton, it actually gets flung outward by conservation of angular momentum, keeping it in a stable orbit. What that means is... I can solve, I can use this as my potential energy in my one-dimensional Schrodinger equation, and I can go back to the shooting method. 
And just like before, I can get bound states and scattering states. So I might have a bound state uh, here if my energy is less than zero, right? This is potential energy equal to zero here. If I potential energy less than zero, then I have a bound state and I have my electron trapped in the atom. I have it trapped in an atomic orbital. On the other hand, if I have my energy up here, if my energy is greater than zero, then I have a scattering state. And my electron can fly off to infinity and never come back. If you've taken a chemistry course, you know this value, you know this difference as the ionization energy. Right? So there's this value on the periodic table, ionization energy. It's how much energy it takes to rip an electron from the atom, send it off to infinity, and never see it again to ionize the nucleus of the atom. That comes straight out of this treatment in quantum mechanics. So the ionization energy is one of the many things that the quantum mechanical model of the atom predicts. One other thing I'll point out, uh, these bound states, they get labeled by an integer. So they get labeled by M. Uh, and by L. So these two share a label L here. And so this N, L, and M, this is the stuff that you know from your chemistry class as your quantum numbers, right? This is the energy level. This is the angular momentum number. And this is the angular momentum Z component. And so if you've taken a chemistry class, you recognize these as those orbital values that label the orbitals. Quantum mechanics is where those come from. Uh, sometimes this is called M sub L to indicate that it's related to this L value. Uh, this N value can go anywhere from uh, 1, 2, 3, up to infinity. This L value can go anywhere from 0 uh, up to N minus 1. And this ML value can be anything from negative L up to zero, up to L. They're all integers. This one can be anything at once, starting with one. This one can go from zero to N minus one. And this one's any integer between negative L and L. So first, let's take a visual look at these spherical harmonics. So these, again, are kind of the 3D sines and cosines. They come from this differential equation it's a little bit more complicated than the standard one for sines and cosines but it comes out to be the same thing it's a derivative of y that comes out to be the same function y multiplied by a negative constant and that has these periodic boundary conditions so if you want you can read or watch derivations of these things i prefer to simply call them from a library so we're going to use scipy's special library here to call in the spherical harmonics harm. Uh, in order to visualize these things, we're going to set up a grid of spherical coordinates. So instead of being x and y, there's going to be phi and theta, latitude and longitude. Uh, we're going to convert those into Cartesian coordinates here because that's the only thing Matplotlib can understand in 3D. And here we're just making a function called graph spherical harmonic. So in particular, we're going to be looking at the absolute value of the spherical harmonic. So this is going to be their modulus. Remember, these are complex values. So they have a real part, an imaginary part, and then a modulus that gives you an idea of how large that value is, how far away it is from zero. And those values are going to be color coded. You could change this to look at the real or imaginary part if you want. We're just going to look at the modulus here. Uh, so what it's going to do, it's going to create a figure for us, and it's going to create these sliders. We've worked with these before to change L and M. So let's run this just to get it uh, restarted. And what you can do now, you can change the L value. So for example, let's suppose I ch drop L, uh, excuse me. The one thing you don't want to do is drop L down to zero. That actually makes the graph uniform and it ends up with a divide by zero. Uh, yeah, we don't want to do that. So just start with L and one. L, is, L equals zero is boring. It's, it's uniform. It's, it's just a, a solid colorful sphere. Uh, for the simplest example though, with one zero, we've got uh, high values up here and then low values down here. So you can think of this as going from a maximum up here to a minimum down here. So you can get this kind of dumbbell shape, basically, where the thing is flaring out at the top and then going into the middle there. 
Uh, I could also change M. Remember, M can have any value from uh, negative L to L. It's actually the same for negative M value, so we'll ignore that part. This one's flared the opposite way. This one's more donut shaped, where it's flaring out in the middle and then caving in at the top, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that only gives us two possible values for M. As you increase L, it gives you more possible values for M. So here we get a little bit more interesting shape. We got the dumbbell up at the top, and then we have this little ring around the middle. You now increase M to one and then to two. And basically you can see that these bands change as you increase M. In fact, the higher M you get, the fewer of these bands that you get. So like for example, M equals one, we got a top band and a lower band. For M equals zero, we have a uh, top band, uh, kind of a middle band here. It's just basically changing the number of these flares that you get. Here you get the top one and you get the, the bottom one here. You don't get the one in the middle. And then here you just get one around the equator. And so you can use this to get a visual idea of what these spherical harmonics looks like. If you've ever seen those uh, probability balloon things in your chemistry textbook, this is where those come from, is from these spherical harmonic functions. And again, the higher you make L, the more of these bands it's possible for you to get. So that's the angular part of the hydrogen atom wave function, then we need the radial part. This is a one dimensional problem. So we can use the shooting method once again. The main difference now is we have our potential energy here of negative k e squared over r, and we have to take these derivatives and make them 3D, because even though we've separated the variables, we still have to take into account the fact that r exists in a 3D space. So you have the second derivative of the wave function, just like you had before, then you have this uh, other piece here, this 2 over r dr dr, plus your constant from the Schrodinger equation, we have the energy value, we have the potential energy, and then we have the centrifugal term. So this is what we call the pseudo potential because it behaves as if you have the original potential energy plus this modification here that goes like 1 over r squared. So these two are competing terms because one is positive and one is negative. So this is our modified Schrodinger equation. It's a little bit longer than we had before, but it behaves the same way. We can still use the shooting method. We just have a different equation for R double prime. Our R double prime is now a little bit more complicated. Here's the uh, R prime divided by R part. Here is the energy. Here is the original uh, potential energy. And here is the centrifugal piece. And our, uh, our, yeah, our new uh, potential energy is now Ke squared over R. And uh, we're multiplying by Z, the atomic number, just in case we wanted to, mod to model uh, helium or lithium or some other element instead. But then your, uh, your shooting method works the exact same way. You put in your guess for the energy. I'll give you a hint. These need to be negative to get a bound state. And what you'll get out is a graph of the wave function versus R, the radial part. So when you think about this in terms of a 3D version, you have to imagine this thing kind of rotating around in 3D and getting modified in and out by the spherical harmonics that we had over here. Or you can think of this thing as you expand out, it oscillates up and down. Uh, as R increases, it's really difficult to visualize uh, in 3D. Um, but then what you'll do, you'll try to get this for different values of n and l. Remember, uh, l can go all the way up from 0 to n minus 1. So for n equals 1, you have l equals 0. For n equals 2, you can have l equals 0 and l equals 1. For 3, you can have 0, 1, and 2. So for each one of these that you get, you can get multiple different versions for the different l. The nice thing is this energy value that you guess up here does not change with l. It only changes with n. So once you find E1, you automatically know what it is for L0. Okay, there's only one value there. Once you find E2, you know what the energy value is for L equals 0 and for L equals 1. For E3, you already know what the energy value is for L equals 0, 1, and 2. So you get multiple wave functions for one energy eigenvalue. This is what we call degeneracy, where there's multiple wave functions with the same energy level. Uh, so you'll play around with that. And then down here, look, there's more expectation values. So you use this to calculate the expectation value of the position. Uh, really important process there because that tells you where the electron is likely to be.